So as we take this moment, we're going to go ahead and dial in into the space. And the reason why we do this is because we've learned that there is a specific algorithm to the planet. This is what I call it. It's an algorithm to this cosmos. There's a sequence in the order of creation. We started eneology this week, and we talked deeply about that uh, in our introduction to eneology. And we talk about how the order of creation was the most treasured thing for the adept because in knowing the order of things, then first you knew how not to make certain mistakes. And then you also knew how to pinpoint when certain things were occurring and where that was even coming from. So there was an unlimited amount of knowledge that you could gain and wisdom that you can gain in application from just knowing the sequence to how the creation came into play and through what order. We have the specific numbers as we talk about that mayat is akin to math. It is the same word and it is exact. It is perfect and that this knowledge was one of the levels of superior knowledge on the planet that had been passed to us from our ancestors. And this knowledge actually utilizes numbers not for just counting money or counting one's possessions, which was always seen as, as taboo. In the ancient cultures, you never counted your camels. It was seen as bad luck. You could gather, you know, I, there is, I don't know, 40 or so, but you would never try to count things exact or use numbers to count because it was known as something profane to do since numbers were in fact archetypes. Numbers connect then to planets and numbers connect to your organs and numbers can be connected to everything in existence. Not because of there's this mathematical uh, code in phi, 3.16, and then they just go nuts on the numbers with you and make you numb with the numbers. <laughs> it's because that when you know the archetypes in front of, behind, and on the side of the numbers, then you're able to see energies and you're able to basically use a different system of summarizing what you're experiencing rather than, I guess what I'm saying here is, is that even conversation and talking is not the pr premium way to get knowledge. We would be here forever if I was trying to explain to you forever. If I was trying to explain to you something for 10,000 years in detail, we'd be here for at least 10 years trying to explain this. And this is what I, I sent across uh, just recently in one of my texts for, uh, on Instagram or whatever. But just for everybody to know, if we've been here for, let's say, millions of years, or let's even say 5,000 years, I mean, we can at least prove that that is, that is the time span at least that we've been here if we want to use time. What that means is if I'm going to explain to you 5,000 years and what's gone on in detail, this is going to actually take at least 50 years. So if you are already at, let's say, 30, you would spend till 80 trying to comprehend what I'm actually saying or listen to my, the whole story that I'm trying to give you, and that wouldn't even equate to you putting it into application. So what I'm saying is language is actually, you know, it's great for the form of communication we're using now because we have to, but it is actually one of the most primitive ways to communicate. You can always compress ideals within archetypes and symbols, and that's what numbers also are. They are symbols. Like one is a straight line for the sun because it is a beam. The sun sends out a beam or a ray, and it is the only thing that is straight in a curved reality. So these archetypes lend to us a different level of awareness, just like the number two has that curve on it, and when you start tapping into things from that way and then you realize how that replicates within the entire reality, that's when you gain, let's say, like this master code. And then this master code allows you to summarize everything going on in the experience within seconds, within minutes versus lifetimes. OK. So we dial into this code one, two, nine, five, three, six, eight. And this is because uh, this is the days of the week. We have Sunday coming in at number one. We have Monday coming in at number two. And we have then Tuesday coming in at number nine. And then we have Wednesday coming in at number five. We have Thursday coming in at number three. And we have number six coming in on Friday. And we have number eight coming in on Saturday. Okay. And so that's the sun. That's the moon. That's 
Mars, and then there's Mercury, and then there's Jupiter, and then there's Venus, and then there's Saturn. And without getting caught up into all of the external dogmatic traditions around these planets, which are numerous, as numerous as the humans, because they, these are just organs, so the stories are going to be just as intrinsic as all the different types of experience that a variety of the humans have here on the planet. And then, of course, you have four and seven, which we haven't talked as much about, but we do bring awareness to that there's only nine numbers here and that there's two more, and that's four and seven. And these numbers are often hidden, meaning they're, they're very occult-related because from my deciphering and awareness and experience, I'm seeing that the numbers four and seven are more related to Leviathan or what is called Leviathan in the Gnostic text. And this is what some also refer to as Ouroboros, but it is basically the great dragon or serpent that is surrounding the entire enclosure. So I think even the flat earthers will agree about this, that the planets are actually inside of the, inside of the vault or inside of the enclosure, but then the sky as you know it is known as Leviathan, which is covering from the top all the way to the bottom and surrounding the entire space like a womb. And the reason why these two numbers, one is four, that's the head of the dragon, and then seven is the body of the dragon, it plays such a vital role, and it's always been, been cannotated as the moon, and it's because that there is basically this Wittershins or Diesel, this dark or light, this good or bad, or yin or yang aspect to everything. So even if we say that since everything is under this influence of what you're seeing now in this space, that's why Earth is not on this chart of planets because it's like you're in it. So there's no need to actually find a place for it. You understand? So what happens is, is that if you take, let's say, even, uh, I don't know, let's take a planet like Mercury, right? And you got a Mercury on the planet. Right, this is a number five. This is anybody whose uh, uh, day of birth, let's say, is the 14th, one plus four is five. Is the fifth or the, uh, let's say, the um, 23rd, any of those days of birth, it puts them onto this path of being a number five. However, just because they're a number five in their Mercury, it doesn't mean that they won't come under the influence of what can be seen as the full moon and the new moon. So just, just say this from your own personal perspective. During full moon, your attitude can be like one way. And then during new moon, that attitude will shift and be another way. And this happens for all of us. So this has always been known as, again, this is the number four and seven. But this is, again, the numbers that many of the, especially in Western occultism, have attempted to master because these numbers really master over everything. They kind of determine, you know, yeah, you may be bright like the sun, but are you amplified or are you degenerated? Are you yin or are you yanged? And of course, this is what puts us all through the motions. This is what creates the seasons. This is what creates the varieties. Okay, so that's what these two numbers mean. So we're going to take a moment. And I do have some incense uh, going here or some, uh, some resins happening uh, in the space. And this is also a time for that if you have, you know, your sage or your Palo, Palo Santo that you can light it up. And the reason why we do this is because actually we do want to, I don't know if I use the term run away, but for people who are not used to doing this kind of thing or bored by this kind of thing and don't understand the value of it and are looking for something else, it's good to let them pass on to wherever they're going to go next, like whatever YouTube page they're going to hop on to next to get that immediate gratification. It's like a sugar fix for occultism. So they can go and get that because they're still going to end up here anyway at some point in relation to if they really want to grow their being. Not my being. You see what I mean? It's like, I'm not here for you to grow my being. <laughs> you see what I mean? That's my own personal responsibility. So two, it should be the same thing for you that you are here to grow your being and that is your first priority and you're learning the methods and the techniques in which to do that because I'm allowing my diary, as I call it, to be open to you 
of something that I have to also go through and something that I also have to do. And because the human body is very high maintenance, it's like a high maintenance female. It is really, it's flesh, right? So because it's so high maintenance, this means that I always have to do this check and balance system with myself every single day. Balance is not something that you just achieve and that's it. Balance, especially in what I explained to you before about the Wittershins and the Deedles, the, the new moon, the full moon, the yin and the yang, the balance has to constantly be recalibrated. That's why you're an alchemist. That's why you're a mathematician. So you have to be able to know, and you can predict the future. You can know what's going to come tomorrow and what energies are going to be present. All of this stuff is known. It's already written, literally. You know, sometimes they make that statement, it is written. And it sounds like, oh, man, that's so mystical. But no, it's literal. It's written in the sky that how we are even brought about and what influences we go through are already scripted. But there is a space that we're going to go to where there is no script. And this is the preparation for going into that space, getting yourself prepared for the release. Okay? And so just remember, there's no rush. You have infinity. Some will take lifetimes to do it. Some will do this this life. Right? Some have done it already and just waiting on their orbital exit. So we take a moment and we dial in first to the number one. Now, also... I have to paraphrase all of this because someone will say, well, how do you know? Right. And that's why we, we love to lean on my for that, because, you know, my is a, a higher stage of knowing it is a sequence of things that lets you know, OK, this is on point. So I want you, if you have your pen and paper right now to take the numbers one, two, nine, I'll say it slow. One, two, nine and write these numbers down. One two, nine, five, three, six, eight. Okay. I'll take a moment. If you need to grab your calculator, unless you're really good at math, you can probably type in calc on any computer search box that you're on and it'll pull up the calculator. All right. Like I said, this is the breathing in today. So you take one plus two plus nine plus five plus three plus six plus eight. And what do you get? So Mike, could type it in the chat box just to make sure that we on point. When you add all that together, what do you get? And I know that stream has to take a moment to catch up. <laughs> One, two, nine, five, three, six, eight gives you 34. And of course, three plus four is seven. Okay, so that's our seven days of the week. So this will let you know also that this is not a haphazard creation. If it was haphazard, meaning that it was a mistake, it wasn't supposed to happen, it comes back void. And what that means is that it aborts. It never comes into fruition. It never happens. You never reach a stage of awareness. This reality is, like they say, and, and it was good. <laughs> when they make that statement, and it is good, and it did not come back void. This means that, okay, we figured out a sequence, and it's working. Let's not reinvent the wheel here. OK, now I'm going to go even further today. Now add from with the number 34, add the number four. So this is 34 plus four plus seven. And what do you get? So this would be one plus two plus nine plus five plus three plus six plus eight plus four plus seven. What do you get? And I'll let that breathe for a minute for my mathematicians. So obviously, from that, and I'm just going to wait for that first text so I can even see what the lag is on the chat over here. All right, some are going to, yeah. all right, so, uh, all right, so yeah, I guess the lag on the chat is even more than I expected. So, so there it is, okay, 45, all right, so, and then 4 plus 5 is what? Is 9. 
So that gives you nine numbers. So do you see here also, well, before I get into that, so what you see here is you see mathematic perfection, but you see it actually in a clear way because, yeah, some say it's a Fibonacci. Some say it's the golden ratio. It's the golden mean. But if you flunked out of math, all of that is like, oh, oh shit, fractions? No. Algebra? No. <laughs> right? So this is just a very practical way of understanding that there is archetypes. Don't use this for like you're trying to add up math and money, but there are archetypes with the creation that allow the creation to be perfect. The perfect nine. Now, nine has these weird phenomena with it, which you're already aware of, right? So anything that you times by nine equals a uh, derivative of nine, right? So nine times two is 18. One plus eight is nine, right? Nine times three is 27. Nine, uh, uh, two plus seven is nine, right? So you've seen that ph phenomenon. Nine times nine is 81. Eight, eight plus one is nine. But another phenomenon that's actually missed is actually what happens to numbers when you add any number from one to nine, when you add nine to it, it reflects itself. So as an example, nine plus three, right, is 12. One plus two is three. Hmm. Nine plus four is what? 13. One plus three is four. Okay. So energetically, this is what ancient knowledge is really about is that you feel this you get this essence like okay well you're saying that this power mirrors back anything that comes to it so it's almost like being it's almost like it can turn you back anyway in addition that it can make you only see yourself when you're working with the addition side of it so this is when you go into I'll call this the guided meditation with yourself. This means that you're literally just, you know, you're there and you're thinking about some stuff and this stuff is taking you in deeper. This is the kind, that's a guided meditation. It's not meditation, but it's the guided meditation. The meditation, you're not doing anything. It is so difficult to really meditate. And I'm saying it's difficult as not trying to put a hurdle or a stumbling block in front of you, but not to, uh, to allow meditation to be what it truly is, to hit the medium or the center space of self. You cannot be doing anything. The mind must be still. And when you think of Tibetan masters, Dojin masters, Bodhisattvas, and all of that, all they've done is been able to achieve this state. But it shouldn't be seen as a light matter, meaning that something that is so easy to do. To make your mind still and not even ask you the question, are you, did you not think? Or are we okay? You know, it, 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 I'm, I'm ready to get up. My, my leg hurts. Or I think the music's turning off. I don't like that track. Is he done yet? All of those different things that go on and meditate that in, in, in our process of trying to reach meditation are, is not meditation. But then the guided meditation, which we've become very fond of, is when someone is talking or even your mind is talking and you're trying to get into a deeper aspect of yourself, okay? So utilizing numbers and understanding their planetary uh, um, archetypical natures and then connecting that in with your body, which it is already there, opens up a real world for you, of some facts, because this doesn't allow you to lean on others' understanding. You can lean on your own, all right? So... Now that we go through, now that we understand that, we can now go into this guided meditation of clearing this space within ourselves and getting ourselves aligned properly. You know, this is something that you can do on your own. This is something that you can do at any point in time. And when you know this sequence, like we're making this readily available, you don't have to join Enneology to know this, even though you'll learn many things in Enneology that we haven't had the time and the opportunity to write in other places. You already have cosmic energy, which uh, I think the little bot is sharing the link to the cosmic energy. And those same numbers in cosmic energy, and we're still going to put four and seven in there with the correspondences, but those same numbers that you see in cosmic energy is exactly what we're talking about right now. So you're then able to see the planet. You're able to see all the correspondences. You're able to see the colors. You're able to see the frequencies. So you have all these components now. There's no paywall there separating you from this. The only thing that is separating you is yourself and the time that you're going to need to spend to dial into self. 
So that's why in a very stimulated reality, it's like, you know, I even have it happen to me from time to time. It's like I go from here and I go and do this and I go and do this and I go and do that. And then the day is over with and I haven't spent much time on self. Now, I have this benefit, though, because I actually do things in the realm of consciousness. So generally, whatever I'm even doing is going to be related to consciousness. But let's just imagine I just, you know, I worked at the auto parts store. So a lot of my time is going to be spent on dealing with that. And at the end of the day, I'm going to probably want to break. I'm not going to want to go into learning deep knowledge about myself. Right. So you have to train yourself for this type of habit of spending time to go through these sequences. And like I say, know it like the back of your hand. Right. So know this knowledge. Like so when I like flashcards. If you're thinking about, you know, creating games for children, you know, we're still working on that. But if you want to do that already in your own space, you know, create these flashcards. Boom. Number nine. What is that? And then the child, that, 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 that's Mars, you know, and then letting the child know, you know, this is the this is your path, you know, in the path that the energy that you're working with. Right. And so even for you as an adult, one, two, nine, five, three, six, eight, you should know those planets that correspond to that and you should know their story. That's another part that is going on inside of ambassador training now where we have meditations that are already done in there to dial you into the metaphysical aspect of what these numbers mean. Because there's a physical, there's a way that this can apply to your life, your business, your relationships, all that kind of stuff. The external, if you may, and internal, I won't just limit that to external, but that, you know, your life. And then there's these parts of it that apply even deeper. The metaphysical aspects, the things that are harder to articulate, meta in itself meaning not able to be or barely able to be articulated through a lexicon, through language, okay? So as we dial in, we start off at Sunday and we find that Sunday in itself is a synthesis. It is the seed also. The sun is a seed, Okay, that's why it's constantly planting seeds. You see a lot of archetypical symbols around this, and this is the meditation. You can close your eyes and just, you know, see these visions. You know, use your projector, use your third eye in order to be in awareness of this, that you have that solar body within you, which is a seed. Notice that a seed contains every part of the tree, but it's not unpacked. It's not unpacked yet. So then comes two, which is the moon. And the moon, like the womb, is responsible for breaking down this potent essence of the sun into smaller morsels so that it can be digested. So this is very similar to as a child's in the belly of the mother, the mother will eat something, but that will be processed through her own alchemical system and then bought into a liquid so that way it can become nourishment for the child, okay? So that's why the moon is the division component. It divides things, but it does that so that it's able to break it down into smaller morsels for those who are not ready to take the full on strength of the synthesis of the sun. And then it shows you literally why you should not need to rush anything because the next number is nine. It is a connotation of Mars. It is an awareness of a mediator or a peacemaker, but also a protector. That in this process of what we could say is creation, since we're talking about numbers and we're talking about sequences, the next stage as this seed or as this child is being fed, these small morsels is now protection because it's now going to take time for you to grow. So this is like a farmer has to generally put a hedge around their crops or put something there to protect them. That is number nine. That's why it's not one, two, three. It's one, two, nine, right? And so as the nine sets in and offers that protection, that's also the cherub around the garden of life, the flaming fire. This is all Mars's behavior and Mars's potential and abilities, right? And then time will come eventually for the gestation, which brings us to the number five, which is actually Mercury. And this is because now that you gestated, like a child now comes out of the womb, what's going to happen? Man, the child's going to be absorbing everything. The child is going to start speaking the language. 
This child is going to start writing. The child is going to start everything about even our existence because we have this mercurial component always within us. It's always about writing something down or logging something or taking a picture of something and storing something. And even the DNA moves in this kind of way. So this is your five. This is what they say, the thought or the mercury, the one that's moving fast because the growth process is happening now. The slow process is kind of over. And then now this rapid growth is taking place based on the exposure. So then that gives you the five. And then what rolls next? Now that you're getting, now that you're absorbing, now that you're storing, now that you're learning, what occurs? And now we see where Jupiter comes into play, which is number three, the guru, right? This is the orchestrator. This is the one that knows how to use this. This is the one that's also abundant. Always seen as large because there's so many things that have been gained. You can imagine it's like Mercury has been there eating all of this stuff and now it's morphing into Jupiter. This is also letting you know that there's no conflict truly between these numbers, these planets and systems. They're all derivatives of each other. They depend on the other to get to the next stage. So now you see Jupiter and why it's always seen as being jovial because also and this is, of course, when it's in its perfected stage. And that's why we teach genealogy, because just as it could be jovial, it could also be really grumpy. There's a yin and there's a yang. There's a four and there's a seven to each of these archetypical personalities. But we're talking about this perfect state when it doesn't come back void. Now it morphs into the number three. And then now also it is jovial. Notice how if you have a lot of things, for many people that produces more distaste it produces more uh, uh sadness right like you get a lot of things that means there's more things to lose you can get attached to things so that's what jupiter also has to deal with in perfecting itself the number three has to deal with that in perfecting itself but of course in a perfect state as they say in a perfect world jupiter is happy about all of this abundance and knows how to utilize all that abundance and knowledge. It doesn't become like, you know, you have a lot of knowledge and then, you know, now you're the guru and then now it's just, it's tearing you apart because you, you know, you can't master or handle just having that much energy and power. Okay. And then as it keeps metamorphosizing, this creation must keep replicating itself. That's why it, it, it this cannot stop this process. Something has to encourage us to keep going. Something has to be steadfast and faithful in the process. And this is, of course, our number six, which is Venus. You know, Venus is, is, is always seen as uh, being the most dedicated. It's like the woman that's with you no matter what happens to you. Now, remember, there's, a, there's another side to this. There's another side to that energy. You know, there are women that don't stick with anyone, will leave. Will betray, will do all of that, will share themselves with everyone. So that is when the Venus is out of balance, but in a perfect world. She's in allegiance. She's an allegiant. This is even why there are 51 or 50 uh, pentagrams on the flag in the moment, which is a symbol. The pentagram is a symbol of Venus. And then when they put the right hand over the heart, they say, I pledge allegiance, because of course, Venus is the symbol of the heart. It is double phi, okay? For the phi symbol, it's shaped like a six. You put them together, it looks like a heart, okay? And also, in, as far as the chakras are concerned, Venus is known as the heart chakra, okay? So you put your right hand over your heart and you pledge allegiance, okay? I'm with you. We're with each other. This is that energy, okay? And the reason why that's done is because that actually brings the dedication. That brings the passion. There's so many things that kick off in the world because of the abundance. That brings all of that into play. But this looks like a huge party going on at this point. You know, you got Jupiter in there. You know, you have, you know, Mercury, you know, moving around fast. And you got all this going on. So there needs to be what in this story? A check and balance system. It can't just run amok. There must be some hedging. There must be some rules. There needs to be some order in all of this. Order in the court. Who is that? What, what is the court? First of all, the court is the group of all of the numbers. Who's bringing order to the court other than Saturn? Number eight. 
That's why that is. Some people, they just, it's Saturnalian. They, they all worship Satan and they just go on with their own story and they're just making themselves evil because this exists within all of us. So if your only definition of Saturn is that it's an evil planet, you missed it. You're on the surface again. You're just on the snake's face. You didn't go deep into the womb. So it brings us to that eight sets the boundary. Just like you see how the water stops at the shore. If it keeps going, it overruns the forest. Just like you see in a farm that there's the hedging that has to happen. Like somebody has to put the check down or else the weeds just grow up on everything. You even have like plants that will grow up over other plants and just like, this, I'm, I'm going to be in. <laughs> it's more of me. So there must be a check and a balance system within the Neturu, that Saturn. Okay? And that's why most people, they don't like to see Saturn coming because it always means someone is going to get checked. Something, that's why there's the, the reap, the reap, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, scythe in the hand is a farming tool. A lot of people look at that man and they just look at the whole picture and they're just like, oh my goodness, I'm, ah, run. It's a farming tool. It's for one to denote, okay, this is going to happen over here. Okay, you can't, you can't do this or you're going to stop this from even being able to grow. So something has to be able to do that. And of course, this is why most people don't feel that, you know, especially the neophytes, they don't feel generally that, uh, happy about what Saturn is doing most of the time, <laughs> you know, and then of course there's the false representatives of these energies that try to emulate certain parts of their characteristics, right? But this is in a perfect world, how things truly work. And then what surrounds that entire thing, as we talked about is the four and the seven, the four being the head split from the body. The, that's the maverick, right? That's the one that feels unique. That's the one that tries to introduce the uniqueness. And then you have the seven, which is a dynamo, just all pure energy, always on the go, always got something to do, always got a place to be, always like, just like that. And that's the entire creation. So now that we've dialed in properly and now that you're feeling more comfortable in yourself about your experience here, now we're going to go into some of the questions that we have for today. And uh, we're going to see if we're going to do a little rapid fire so we can move through this. But based on what I've already said in this precursor of the conversation, this will actually allow you to become aware of so many different things about yourself. And you'll even be able to answer these questions better than I'm answering them right now. Like I may be in a certain mood, a certain zone, but when you are armed with these powerful archetypes, archetypical energies within yourself, you can answer any question because you know where the energy is coming from. Likewise, when something is off, and this is why it's important to learn enneology, when something is off or imbalanced, you know what component to bring in to balance it. When there's a fire, you don't throw lighter fluid on it. But many of us do that in everyday life. Like we get into a communicative issue and we'll be communicating with someone that we need to learn how that planet or how that energy communicates. But then if we go in with our same old method of how we communicate with things, then we're not going to get the response that we're looking for. And this is why it's so imperative, especially if you're developing or designing or doing things to learn these archetypes, because you cannot reinvent the wheel. This is the sequence and it rolls with nature. It rolls with everything around us.